Hi, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Heather King. I'm the Education Director of Hope Abounds, and I'm very excited to introduce you to Dr. Victor Abraham. Dr. Abraham is a urologist, and he's going to be speaking to all of us today a little bit about what urologists do and how that fits into a potential cancer diagnosis. Now, a little bit about Dr. Abraham is he was trained at Duke, um, spent some time in Boston and in Philly, and then our community is lucky enough that he came to Wilmington and has been here for over 20 years after serving us in the military. You were in the Navy for four years as well, so thank you for your service. Thanks, Heather. So you have a practice here in town called Coastal Urology, and you have um, some mid-levels there as well, some, so some PAs that help you out, and an amazing staff. So what do you and all of your staff do as a urologist in a urology practice? Well, like you know, most adult urologists, uh, we deal with uh, erectile dysfunction, mm -hmm. kidney stones, um, female sexual dysfunction, cancers of the urinary tract, and by that I, you know, urethral, bladder, mm -hmm. kidney, mm -hmm. prostate. Um, that, that's about probably our top four or five. So patients issues. come to you, obviously they're not necessarily even close to a cancer diagnosis. Oh yeah. yeah. So you're able to truly fix and cure many of the issues and symptoms that your patients would come to you Correct. having, yeah. which is wonderful. But there are some patients that come to you and would potentially have a cancer diagnosis. And we're going to focus a little bit today on prostate cancer, if that's okay with you. Um, so what are some of the signs and symptoms that a patient might experience before coming to you to have a potential prostate cancer diagnosis? Well, uh, unfortunately, there's no... Uh, prostate cancer specific symptoms. Most patients come to us because, for us obviously to rule out prostate cancer, but mm -hmm. that can be either a, an elevated PSA blood test mm -hmm. or a PSA that has increased a little too much in a, the span of a year or an abnormal finding on the rectal exam of the prostate. So could they have had some of those tests done at like an internal medicine doctor and then the and you said PSA. Can you PSA. explain a little bit about what that test is for some for sure. someone that would have that? So PSA stands for prostatic specific antigen. It's mm -hmm. been a blood test. It's been around probably for about 35, 40 years. Um, it's a screening test. Mm -hmm. It's not specific for prostate cancer, which makes it a little bit of a, tricky of a test to, to know how to use. But um, it is produced by the prostate and prostate cancer, and when it's elevated, it can be elevated because of prostate cancer, mm -hmm. inflammation slash infection of the prostate, or prostate enlargement. So the trick is what to do with that information right. and find out whether it's prostate cancer that causes the PSA elevation. So just because, say, that this PSA test, the blood test was done mm -hmm. by their primary care doctor and it's elevated and they're coming to you, that does not mean the that they have prostate cancer. Correct, correct. Good. And yeah. that's something important because any time that patients are getting referrals to specialists such as yourself, sometimes mm -hmm. that's concerning to them. They think that if something is elevated that that automatically means a cancer diagnosis, but that is not the case. That is not the case, yes. no. no. Perfect. Uh, and so then you also are able to potentially do a, a rectal exam. Do, do, yep. Yeah. Do we do that and see whether there's a, either a nodule or an as asymmetry, one side being different from the other, whether it be in volume or how hard it is. And that can, you know, point the needle in one direction or the other. Sure. And so those, uh, those two tests are probably the best tools that you have I guess that are as non-invasive as possible to determine whether or not you exactly want to that would help further. gauge our s uh, level of suspicion or the possibility of prostate cancer being the cause of the PSA abnormality. Um, the American Neurological Association recommendation is basically for somebody who has a family history mm -hmm. to start earlier than a man who doesn't have any family history. For African American men with or without history start at age 40. Okay. For white men with family history start at age 40. Okay. Without family history then start at age 50 and then a yearly combination of both PSA and the, the rectal exam. That's great. So there are some guidelines. Oh, yeah. Obviously patients don't necessarily fit perfectly into those guidelines, might have symptoms that would bring them to you earlier than that, yeah. but at least there are some guidelines associated with it. There are. Yeah. 
So I know that prostate cancer, when you talk about cancers that men are diagnosed with, is actually number two behind melanoma in this country. Yeah. And it doesn't discriminate, like you said, you referred to race, and it, it, it's across the board, everyone's at risk. Certain ethnicities, though, do have a higher risk. Yeah, uh, African-American men can, can get hit by prostate cancer at an earlier age, okay. and there can be a more aggressive cancer associated with a lower PSA. So hmm. yeah, yeah, it's uh, more so than white men. Hmm. Yeah, so. Okay, so obviously Hope Abounds is you know an organization that we really help patients with cancer, and we have for the longest time focused on women and children, and now we're branching off and really helping men. As a urologist, you help women and men do, you know, anything, whether it's a cancer diagnosis or not a cancer diagnosis, and that's why we're putting this entire presentation on today. And, you know, it was very interesting to me because we've had so many conversations in the past with breast surgeons and oncology and pathology. and there's such a difference sometimes between cancer itself. And sometimes if someone is diagnosed with cancer, they immediately think, I need that removed yesterday. Yeah. And that is the case sometimes for females mm -hmm. that they have an ovarian cancer or they have a breast cancer and it's certain types of cancer we've talked about where their, their hormones are actually feeding that cancer and making it grow faster. But from a prostate cancer, specifically, obviously mm -hmm. some can be more aggressive than others, but sure. what are your thoughts with the difference between like a, a patient diagnosed with breast cancer and necessarily needing that mm. removed versus a prostate cancer diagnosis? Well, prostate is probably one of the slowest growing cancers in the human body, in men. Mm -hmm. um, and most of the time, hopefully, you, you find it when it's not so advanced right. that you can do something about it. Um, Luckily for us, uh, is one of those cancers that can be treated by either surgery, um, radiation. Even within radiation, there are different forms of radiation. Mm -hmm. There's even crowd therapy where you can freeze the prostate. Uh, so there are several options, and you know which one you choose is going to be a combination of how aggressive the cancer is, how much cancer there's in the prostate, the patient's preference. Mm -hmm. If there's wiggle space for several options, sometimes. Uh, maybe a, you know a patient might have such an aggressive cancer. You try to steer them into the one procedure that has a better chance of, of sure. taking care of it. But you know, if if most men stick to a scheduled uh, yearly screening, hopefully you catch them early enough so that there are multiple options available to that to that gentleman. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. those guidelines that we talked about that are in mm -hmm. place for screening might help them get diagnosed at an earlier age. Yeah. So men should go in for their regular checkups, yeah. which we know they always do, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but in a perfect world, they would, and that hopefully would help you be able to catch that diagnosis a little bit earlier, and then the patient has more options, exactly. correct? Yeah. The sooner you find it, the you know, better chance of a cure and more options that the patient could have. Absolutely. And, you know, we talked about how sometimes prostate cancer can be aggressive. Sometimes it can be very, very slow growing. Mm -hmm. I know that um, I've, I've read things from the American Cancer Association that quite a few men actually have prostate cancer, but then it's actually something else that ends up taking their That's life. Right. You know, prostate cancer being such a slow growing uh, in, indolent tumor mm -hmm. um, might take over a decade to really cause you significant harm to the point that it will be the cause of uh, passing away. But uh, the fact is that uh, studies have shown if, if you were to take, let's say, uh, look at 80-year-old men mm -hmm. in their 80s, probably s between 70 and 80 percent of them harbor some degree of prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. But the vast majority of these men are not going to die from the prostate cancer. They're going to die with it, but not as their death will not have anything to do with the prostate cancer. It's such a slow grower. Hmm. And it happens in such a high frequency as we age. So it's actually found at time of death. Yeah, it was yeah. never signs or symptoms yeah. or anything yeah. that yeah. caused them to come see exactly. a urologist. You know, and, uh, and that's uh, confirmed by studies done many years ago where they took men who died of something else and they would, as part of the uh, autopsy, look at the prostate. And mm -hmm. that's how they showed that a lot of them did have some prostate cancer. So the idea nowadays is to not necessarily 
diagnose it in a late 70s or, or 80s year old man at that point we suggest not screening anymore right so we try to get the the the, the patients who are younger who have the more aggressive cancers and then you can really make a difference absolutely uh, and PSA has helped significantly in, in that respect because now we're we, we've had a what is called a stage migration where we've catching the cancer much earlier le than we did 40 years ago 50 years ago which is wonderful from yeah. a patient perspective for care yeah. so say a patient comes to you and we're gonna take just a few steps back from mm -hmm. what we've talked about and they have an elevated PSA mm -hmm. and you do a digital rectal exam you find something that you don't like what would be the next the next in that patient we would make sure that uh, first of all we have a PSA mm -hmm. if the digital rectal exam if the PSA is abnormal, and by that I mean any value above four in the general male population, but if you have a really young patient, like somebody in their 50s or younger, then you might want to look at age-specific PSA, which, for example, the cutoff wouldn't be 4.0 anymore. Perhaps it might be something closer to 2.0. Mm. And if you feel like this uh, patient could have prostate cancer, then you go on to do a biopsy. And that's a procedure that takes about 10 minutes. It's done mm -hmm. in the office under, okay. you know, Valium to relax their nerves. Mm -hmm. And then we're able to, to numb the prostate with lidocaine and make it so it's not a painful procedure. Um, about 15 years ago, somebody discovered the fact that we could numb the prostate with lidocaine and make the procedure, which two decades ago was quite uncomfortable, mm -hmm. to, you know, a procedure you can do and be done in 10 minutes with very little patient discomfort. Uh, basically, we do six biopsies in the right lobe, six biopsies in the left lobe. We, uh, these are random biopsies. Mm -hmm. uh, we go lateral, medial on, on each side for a total of 12, and within five working days, or you know, we can get a, a report. Um, you know, the accuracy of it is probably at least 80%. Mm -hmm. uh, the smaller the prostate, the better the quality, the assurance of the biopsy being uh, a true positive or a true negative. And patients go home the same day. Some of them go back to work the next day. That's wonderful. So sure. you can do it in your office. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily pain-free, but it's it's able to be done in a way that the patient has minimal discomfort. Correct. And can you elaborate a little bit as to, you said if it's a smaller prostate, mm -hmm. it can be more accurate versus a larger prostate. Why would that be? Well, the, the process of finding prostate cancer uh, through biopsies is a random biopsy. We're not targeting like for breast breast tumors, breast lesions, you know, where the either ultrasonographer or the mammogram, the patient or the doctor found a lesion, they can target, put a needle in it and then, you know, go down and get it out. Right. An excisional biopsy. With, with the prostate, uh, at least in the first round of biopsies, it's a random process. So mm -hmm. it's like finding a needle in a haystack. The prostate being the haystack. If it's very large, the chances that with 12 biopsies you're going to possibly uh, miss a small focus of prostate cancer sure. is much higher versus a smaller prostate. Better chances of having a true, a true uh, result. No, that makes complete sense. It's sure. just, it's nice that there's at least an option, and it has closer to mm -hmm. getting them to that diagnosis. Sure. So, you do twelve different biopsies. Mm -hmm. If just one comes back positive, is that good enough to get a cancer diagnosis? Does that mean that they have cancer? Yeah, I think I think so, for the same reason. I mean, just because yes. you found the one doesn't mean that if you were to take even more, you would find two or three sure. positive cores. Um, depending on how aggressive that cancer is, and we, we have a system called the Gleason grading system mm -hmm. that helps us determine. Basically, it's, a, it's an interesting score. It's, it's not one through five. It's three to five, mm -hmm. and three being the least aggressive, five being the most aggressive. So the one patient who only has one core with all Gleason grade three is what we call a low risk patient. So mm -hmm. you know that patient, then your options, you don't have to rush to, to do any active treatment at that very point, right. very moment. But uh, if you have a patient who comes back, let's say six, eight, 10 biopsies were positive out of 12, the Gleason's are four, maybe some five, then that's a lot that's a more serious cancer that you need to sure. get aggressive with or, you know. Absolutely. More. So after you take the, the biopsy, the cores, you send mm -hmm. them to pathology. Pathology mm -hmm. comes back to you with a report that gives you this Gleason score. Correct. That helps you determine or have a better conversation with the patient yeah. as far as their potential treatment path. Mm -hmm. So you have all these different treatment paths depending on 
the severity of sure. what comes back. And like you said, it's definitely, you know, it, it is kind of a needle in the haystack, right? Yeah. So you, you're doing the best you can with the information that you have. And in a perfect world, we would have something like breast cancer has, where you would be able to know exactly where that tumor is yeah. and to be able to target that tumor. But it's just not possible in prostate. No, right now. Uh, but we're definitely closer nowadays than we were a few years back. You know, uh, for example, the one patient that you do a round of biopsy and it comes back negative. But two, three, four years later, they come back with a PSA elevation that was a little too fast. Mm -hmm. Then uh, you do have the option, and this is a new technology for us, is to do an MRI of the prostate. Mm -hmm. It's an imaging study of the prostate. And uh, now we have a way to match what we see under ultrasound guidance at the time of biopsy with any potential nodule for high-grade tumors, meaning at least in grade 7 or higher, on the MRI image, so you can superimpose them, and if you find a, a, a lesion, then you can target that, that position and increase your chances of finding it if it's there. That's great. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. So that would be something that you would refer them to radiologists? Radiologists for the MRI part, mm -hmm. and then uh, based on the report, the findings, then he would come back and we would discuss whether we should go ahead and rebiopsy or not. Perfect. Um, then you'd have yeah. an idea of where. Exactly. To focus. Yeah, they give you a pretty, you know, uh, detailed description of the location of the prostate within the prostatic anatomy. Mm, and that's wonderful. It just helps provide more direction and sure, clarity. Sure. Sure. You know, and there are situations where you might have somebody whose PSA just over the years continues grow, going up and going up a little too fast. Mm -hmm. And if we have to, we'll go to the point where. Well, let's do a, like, like a saturation biopsy, which is basically instead of 12, maybe do 20, 25, 30 biopsies. And uh, during the dust conditions, you want to go to the operating room. You know, it's just, uh, it is no more, you know, it, it is not more difficult than doing a regular biopsy, just taking a lot more. Sure. You know, and hopefully if that comes back negative, then, you know, you're reassured, the patient is reassured that there's nothing likely to worry about. That's wonderful. Despite having an elevated PSA. Well, and that's great. And, and there yeah. are other things that cause PSA increase, like we had talked about. Yeah. So this helps rule it out. Are there any other specific things that you would, you know, think that patients should know about that might cause an elevated PSA? Well, PSA can be elevated by intercourse, the, you know, day or two before the biopsy. So obviously, uh, if they come back, we try to educate them and say, listen, just abstain for a few days, see if that sure. PSA comes back. In the old days, we used, we used to give antibiotics to see if there was bacteria in the, the, if there were bacteria in the prostate causing the PSA elevation, but that's something we're getting away from. It doesn't really, probably causes more harm than does good sure. to try to bring it that way. The rationale being is, is this, um, if you give a patient, let's say, seven, ten days of a strong antibiotic, to eradicate bacteria in the prostate, and what you end up doing is you're changing the whole flora of the gut. When we go transrectal in the biopsy, we c could end up creating a uh, antibiotic-resistant strain of E. coli or another other form of the colon mm -hmm. uh, environment, and then we could increase the chances of making the patient sick with fever, acute prostatitis, with a resistant strain, and that, that wouldn't be so good. So more... Uh the, I guess the, the risks don't outweigh the benefits with yeah, certain you things. Yeah, you get more, more <laughs> of a downside than you get an upside right. from that maneuver. So uh, that, that's pretty much been established that probably not worth doing as an exercise. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. And I've also heard that increased like bike riding and things like absolutely. that can also increase sure. PSA. Bicycle, so. yeah. yeah. So anything that basically puts pressure in the perineal area uh, could affect the PSA value. Uh, infection, obviously, of the prostate, mm -hmm. uh, and oftentimes that's an empiric call as to uh, whether that is a possibility. Uh, plus, I mean, sometimes we'll have an abnormal PSA in the absence of a abnormal prostate, and we might just say, oh, well, let's repeat it. Let's repeat it in six, nine, 12 months down the road. Sure. You know, the, the beauty of prostate cancer being typically such a slow grower is that we don't have to do anything right mm -hmm. there, and then we can give the patient time to come back and see if the PSA um, uh, comes back normal, mm -hmm. then let, you don't have anything to worry. No, and that's, yeah. that's wonderful. So say that a patient comes back and you do the biopsy, it comes back and it's low grade. So it's like a three plus three, it's mm -hmm. a low Gleason score. And I know you mentioned three to five, so it's on the lower end. Yeah. 
but the patient has cancer. So yeah. what would a conversation like that sound like with the patient potentially helping them decide what the treatment options are and even navigating, because obviously you're not the only physician that's going to be involved in this process. Sure. So who else would you pull in and what would that conversation sound yeah. like for the patient? Well, I, I would start by if it's a low risk prostate cancer, I would explain to the patient what that means. Mm -hmm and reassure them that this is not a death sentence, mm -hmm. you know, that uh, when it's a, a low risk prostate cancer, it is at a very curable stage. Right. You know, second thing I tell them is you don't need to make a decision today because there's a lot of information we're presenting to mm -hmm. the patient and the spouse and children sometimes there as well. Um, and then I go through from top to bottom, you know, assess, okay, so this is what, what we did, why we did it. Was it a PSA abnormality? Was it a digital rectal exam abnormality? Then I review the PATH report. Mm -hmm. Let's say out of 12, only two came back positive. I even go as far as talking what percentage of that biopsy core was positive, just right. to kind of put a more clear picture for sure. the patient to, to appreciate. And uh, then I talk about treatment options, kind of like almost like a menu. Start from the top. The original, original treatment for prostate cancer was only surgery. Mm -hmm. so, we talk about surgery, the upside and downside of surgery. Uh, then we talk about radiation, you know, external radiation, uh, brachytherapy, also known as the radioactive seeds, mm -hmm. uh, plus or minus then cryotherapy. Uh, active surveillance is if it's an older patient with a low volume, low risk prostate cancer as a potential option. And of course, you know, there, you look at the prior history. I mean, if the patient has had multiple surgeries, infections in the pelvis or, uh, you know, in the abdomen, then surgery going through the front might not be a, such a great idea. Sure. Um, if the patient has had prior radiation to the pelvis, let's say history of colon cancer, then I am, you know, external radiation might not be such a good option. So, so there's a lot of details that go into which way. Um, I feel that if I can narrow the options down to two, Mm -hmm. I can make their job easier. Absolutely, because yeah. every patient's different. Every sure. diagnosis is different. And like you said, there's there's always other things that this patient has lived through or experienced prior mm -hmm. to coming to you. Yeah. So all of that has to be taken into, I guess, the equation to sure. be able to discuss that with the patient. So I'm sure every conversation is very different yeah. depending on the patient. Yeah. You know, and you mentioned before, what other specialists do I work with? And um, as a urologist, obviously, I'm the one who diagnoses, makes mm -hmm. the diagnosis, and uh, sometimes I will refer the patient to the radiation oncologist to discuss the possibility of uh, external radiation or seeds. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I will send them to, let's say, another urologist who might do robotics, which I don't do. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes if the cancer is truly advanced, we might get on a second opinion from a medical oncologist. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah, we work in different specialties, of course directed by how aggressive the cancer is or the patient's preference. I mean, sure. oftentimes the patient is, is in a low risk category, which is a good position to be in because he can make the choice of, okay, do I want surgery? Mm -hmm. Do I want seeds? Do I want external beam radiation therapy? And oftentimes it might boil down to, you know, type A personality or type B personality. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the type A might want the surgery. Type right. B might say, hmm, maybe I want to go with the seeds. Sure. So. Yeah. And every obviously every patient gets to have some say sure. as to what their therapy is going to be. You can help yeah. guide them as a physician, but then it's ultimately their decision yeah. what they end up choosing. Pretty much. So, if a patient wants surgery, yeah. what does that look like? Say it's not robotics. You're performing the mm -hmm. surgery, and what's the potential side effects associated with that? The the healing time and sure. what to expect after. Well, uh, I do mainly the radical perineal approach mm -hmm. uh, in the surgery, when it comes mm -hmm. to surgery versus the, the radioactive uh, mm -hmm. seeds. Um, it is very similar in a way to the robotic, even though they're two coming from two different directions in the sense that the patients recover fairly well, fairly fast. They get to go home not, off, not, uh, not uncommon two days after the surgery. Um, you know, it's like any cancer surgery, if the cancer is confined to the organ, you remove it, by definition, you have achieved a cure. Sure. With regards to prostate, scan ca prostate cancer specifically, um, they go home with a catheter, mm -hmm. catheter uh, through the urethra and into the bladder, and basically what it's doing is stenting the anastomosis, basically. If we remove the prostate, there's the bladder here, mm -hmm. which we have to taper down to a funnel, and the urethra here, we connect them, mm -hmm. and we the catheter helps make sure that the urine will flow freely and not 
come out of the anastomosis and cause scar tissue down the road and maybe a stricter. So that stays in for two weeks. Okay. Okay. Um, potential downside of that surgery, there are two main ones, and those are uh, impotence mm -hmm. or erectile dysfunction mm -hmm. and the possibility of leaking urine you know, on a permanent basis. Okay. Um, I think pretty much anybody who has any of the surgical approaches would expect to have some leakage for several weeks of, or months, and as time goes by, it gets better and better and better until they reach their new baseline. Um, and obviously, the determinants of whether they're going to have erectile dysfunction or um, leakage mm -hmm. is going to be dependent on a lot of factors. Number one, you know, how old the patient was going into it. Sure. Has he had any prior procedures of the prostate before, like a TERP, mm -hmm. uh, prior radiation, prior trauma? Um, how they were doing before the surgery. Right. Um, so. But normally the side effects are quickly and then they get better yes. as the patient gets farther away from that surgical. That is correct. Time. That is correct. Um, when you look at both potential negative outcomes of the surgery, the impotence or erectile dysfunction versus incontinence, the chances of impotence are somewhat higher. Okay. And of course, it's also going to be dependent on the the volume of the surgeon, how many mm -hmm. of these he does. I mean, if you get a, a, a urologist who's doing 150, 200 of these a year, his results are going to be better than the sure. urologist who's doing eight a year or something sure. like that. So Absolutely. it's something important uh, be brought up during, uh, the, you know, during the discussion of what, sure. which way to go. We're getting a second opinion. I mean, it's a... And, you know, we should have probably talked about this in the get it beginning, but the prostate gland, mm -hmm. the whole function... Is reproduction. Right. Yeah. So if it's removed, is yeah. that part of the reason that it causes impotence and... Well, uh, yes. And the reason it, it can happen, it doesn't mm -hmm. happen all the time. Sure. Thank God. But <laughs> um, the nerves that help affect erections... Mm -hmm are sandwiched between the prostate anteriorly and the rectum posteriorly. So being a cancer curing procedure, we have been trained that to cure cancer, you want to take a margin. Margins, you catch, yes. try to catch as many peripheral cells that might have gotten out of the organ. Mm -hmm. And obviously we're fighting, we're fighting a dual battle here. We're trying to cure cancer and at the same time spare these little nerves. I mean, they're truly little, some of them. I mean, they're right. basically like strands of hair running parallel, two bundles of them on the right and left of the back side of the prostate. So, you know, a lot of variables go into it. I mean, mm -hmm. how easy it is to identify the nerves. I mean, does the patient have a history of prostatitis and maybe the nerves are closely adhered to the mm -hmm. capsule? So, yeah, there's not a 100% warranty, unfortunately. Um, that is true for a lot of cancer surgeries. Without but a doubt, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. No, that makes sense. It's, it's just, it's one of those things that your body can still function, yeah. obviously, without yeah. a prostate. But there yeah. are... But you could, for well, it is for reproduction. Mm -hmm. So the prostate itself has nothing to do with directions. Mm -hmm. It's where the fluids come together so pregnancy can be affected. But right. the nerves become collateral damage when you remove right. the prostate. So not only, not only do you lose the uh, possibility of fathering a child, but further collateral damage would be losing erectile function. But... Having said that, we have options to bring that back uh, afterwards if that is the outcome. And you know, other perfect. Okay. Yeah. No, that's that's great. That's very yeah. helpful and informative. Now, say we're going down the radiation route, mm -hmm. and you send them off to radiation oncology. You talked about seeds and mm -hmm. some external radiation. Um, what what does that look like for a patient? How long is that therapy? Sure. And what are the potential side effects? Well, traditionally, the external beam radiation therapy, also known as IMRT nowadays, mm -hmm. has had several evolutions of it. And basically, the evolution of radiation has been to hit the prostate more and avoid hitting the adjacent organs. Again, collateral damage. In the case sure. of the radiation, the, the rectum posteriorly and the bladder superiorly. So they've been able to come out with techniques to, you know, change the beam shapes and number of beams that I make mm. the total beam and avoid those two organs. And uh, up until recently, most people went nine weeks, Monday through Friday treatments. There were short treatments, you know, I think they're like five minute sessions. Sure. Uh, and more recently, they have come out with shorter protocols, more like five weeks, I mean, five days. Mm. Um, 
That's a big difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Basically, for each visit, they just get a bigger bank of radiation. Right. Um, makes it easier. Sometimes uh, it is not practical for the patient. I mean, we have a patient coming from 30, 40 miles away, 50 miles mm -hmm. away. It's a, you know, it would be it might be too difficult to try to come every day to town to have that. Sure. Granted, the radiation oncologists have expanded clinics outside of mm -hmm. Wilmington, so make it easier for people who live outside of the area. Um, and the downside, like anything, any treatment option has upsides and also downsides. There's no perfect uh, option, sure. to, you know, 100 percent of the time. But um, again, collateral damage to the bladder and the uh, rectum. So. And what would, what would that mean to a patient if um, that happened? If it's the bladder, it could be somebody who's now urinating a lot more frequent daytime and nighttime. There is um, post-radiation hemorrhagic cystitis, which is basically bleeding mm -hmm. uh, because the capillaries have been damaged by the radiation within the bladder. And interestingly, it's a, it's a complication that doesn't manifest for two to three or four years out hmm. or longer. Hmm. So the patient comes in with gross hematuria, meaning bloody urine, mm -hmm. and depending on, on the degree, you know, how far we need to go, sometimes we have to go to the operating room, uh, clot evacuate, cauterize bleeders, um, but, you know, that's in the three, maybe five percent incidence of post-external so radiation. It's Relatively low, low yeah. yeah. So with surgery, the side effects are pretty quick if they're going to have any issues, but with radiation, those potential side effects are farther on yeah. long term. And, and they can be temporary. I mean, some of them are temporary, some of them are, you know, might be more permanent. Um, obviously, the patient's baseline urination plays a part mm -hmm. into whether they should have radiation and which form. Uh, for example, with the seeds, the beauty of the seeds for patients with low risk prostate cancer and prostates that are not too large is that uh, they get their treatment, they go to sleep one day in the operating room, the radiation oncologists and the urologists, we put these uh, needles with tiny seeds in the prostate and that's their treatment. They get to go home the same day, no scalpel used, but you know the patient has to fit a criteria sure. to make an ideal patient so they can get ideal results. What would some of those criteria be or not be for okay. seeds to be appropriate? Well, prostate usually not much larger than 45 grams or cc's. Uh, and a, a, a cancer that is low risk, mm -hmm. you know, not a high volume, you sure. know, hopefully old Gleason grade three, um, who doesn't have terrible urinary f symptoms mm -hmm. of uh, frequency, urgency, or nocturia, meaning not getting up at night a whole bunch. Because sure. we expect to see some swelling uh, of the prostate um, mm -hmm. from the seed. So we don't want to do it in somebody who's getting up three times a night already because we're going to make that worse. Sure, yeah, sure. So. And so those seeds are put in, and then that's it. They don't yeah. need removed at a no. later date. Does the body just naturally absorb the, they them? They stay or? in the no, they, They're metal. They're metal. Of, uh, so they stay um, radioactive for about eight months. Um, every two months, you get what is called a half-life, decreases mm -hmm. by a half-life. So the amount, intensity of the radioactive emission is goes from 100 to 50 percent the first month, then from 50 hmm. to 25. So after four half-lives, the equivalent of eight months, the basically the seeds are cold and not emitting radiation anymore. And it's perfectly fine for them to stay in the prostate for the patients. It yeah. doesn't do anything. They're tiny. They're almost like a third the size of the tip of a pen. Oh, wow. They're yeah. very small. Very small. Hmm. Yeah, we end up putting somewhere between 40 and 70 of these. Wow. At a time. So that's how small they are. Wow. So the third option is potentially an active surveillance or watchful waiting discussion. And it's so there. what does that look like for your patients? So basically, if the patient has low risk prostate cancer, has other comorbidities, meaning has other illnesses that might, mm -hmm. you know, looks like might get to them, um, life expectancy maybe less than 10 years, mm -hmm. then we could just visit every six months and check the prostate check a PSA, mm -hmm. see if anything changes. Um, for example, let's say a patient comes today with a 75, 74 years old, low risk prostate cancer, only one, two, three cores positive with all glycerin grade three, we can just do nothing and uh, in six months we'll recheck the PSA. If it stays about the same, the prostate exam doesn't change, then we're fine. If one of those things change, we can rebiopsy. Mm -hmm. Uh, and see whether the cancer has progressed in volume or Gleason grade. Um, 
And then at that time, you might have a different path for that patient, exactly. just depending on the age and, like you said, sure. comorbidities. Comorbidities, urinary symptoms, or absence of those. Um, and so with that sort of a protocol, though, it is important that men do come back when they're supposed to for their PSAs and yeah. exams. Yeah, and I, and I find, you know, at that stage, the patients have made a conscious decision to go that route, and, and, and I find it that they're pretty compliant. They want to know. They, they want Absolutely. to make sure they're, they're, you know, we're keeping a close eye on things. Right. And, you know, our organization definitely tries to empower patients. That's why we do these type of educational programs. And so it's always nice to remind patients that they need to go in for their checks when they're supposed to, when their doctors, such yeah. as you, say to do so. So yeah. was well, there anything else in general that you would like to share with us about prostate cancer or specifically what you're doing for patients or any new treatments that have come along that you yeah. think that people might be aware of? Well, uh, yeah, I would like to mention uh, several years ago we had, um, I guess it's uh, if, um, the U.S. Preventive Task Force come mm -hmm. out with a recommendation to not screen for prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and I think some docs, some primary care physicians have taken it to heart and uh, we are seeing less patients actually being screened for prostate cancer based on that, you know, recommendation made five or six years ago. Uh, when I looked up the composition of the board, I found that there was not a urologist in the board. Mm -hmm. There was no oncologist or somebody else who treated prostate cancer. So I was very somewhat taken aback by such a blunt recommendation to mm -hmm. not. And granted, it's such a slow growing by, lar by and large. But we still get patients who die of prostate cancer. Absolutely. The young patients or the, the middle-aged patient who comes in with a diagnosed with an aggressive cancer. Mm -hmm. So it is not true that we shouldn't screen. I mean, blood test and a digital rectal exam, you know, how expensive right. can that be? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, if you have a family history of prostate cancer, uh, for those men who've been diagnosed and they have uh, uh, ch uh, children, mm -hmm. boys, definitely make sure that they get screened when they hit age 40. Um, yeah, no, that's great. Oh, I mean, there is yeah. a hereditary component to many cancers, and prostate's sure. one of them. It yeah. doesn't mean that that prostate cancer is directly tied to a hereditary component, sure. but it's a possibility. Yeah, you know, at this stage, you know, day and age, we really don't have the techniques to really determine easily was this caused by anything. I mean, what mutations mm -hmm. brought this cancer to be? I mean, the more we learn, the more we we realize how little we r really know at this point. I mean, there's sure. uh, many different mutations that can lead to prostate cancer. Absolutely. So, yeah. And I know that there's been a recent update to National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines within the genetic space. Mm -hmm. um, we've done a lot with genetics with breast and ovarian, but prostate's also in some of those spectrums. Mm -hmm. And the guidelines update recently has said that if it's an aggressive prostate cancer, so one of the higher Gleason scores, like we yeah. talked about, that that in and of itself is a reason to have patients tested genetically. Sure. Doesn't mean you're gonna find it, and it doesn't yeah. mean that if they're diagnosed that that's gonna be the yeah. reason, but at least there's some data out there Sure, now. you know, and uh, we're the early stages of, you know, the technology coming out, mm -hmm. looking at what you just talked about, the genetics of cancer, and, you know, tests that look at multiple mutations Mm -hmm. within the specimen to try to determine, okay, what do we expect the behavior of this cancer going to be down sure. the road? Um, you know, try to take knowledge one step beyond what we expect PSA tells us or Gleason Gray tells us, trying mm -hmm. to get more. You know, I think we're still in the early stages, but Absolutely. I think we, we, we are definitely going to benefit from that. Yeah, I think long term, all of these tests and everyone doing all the studies, whether it's at Duke or Cleveland Clinic or mm -hmm. who knows where, that eventually they'll, it's, it's just better for patient care and, oh, yeah. and hopefully treatment. But, no well, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Abraham, and thank you for all of you for joining us on this episode of Focusing on You. Um, please feel free to go to the website and learn more about prostate cancer diagnosis or other cancer diagnosis. Thank you.